the purpose of this morning session is to give you a basics of EO. It's not going to be too technical, hopefully. It's the, the tools that you will need to help you make decisions as to when to decide when you need to use a certain type of EO or when to not use EO, because it can't do everything, EO as in Earth observation. Um, and then I'll have a little bit of a break and you have opportunities to ask questions as we go along. Um, but I will also then give you a tour of the uh, technology with some ex real life examples of how Earth observation has been used all over the world. So they're not specific to South Georgia and the Falklands, but hopefully they might give you some inspiration like Ross was talking about earlier. Um, and then we'll have Smoko, um, and then I will go into the advantages and limitations of Earth observation data. Like I've already mentioned, it can't do everything, but if you know how to use it, it can be a really valuable tool. And then um, I'll give you some exercises where I'll give you some scenarios where um, I'll give you some requirement, and then I'll ask you what you think Earth observation uh, can do to help you gather information for those scenarios. So hopefully that sort of exercise will give you the tools to be able to make these decisions in your own work area in the future. So that's the purpose of this morning session. So let's start with understanding the terms. You have already heard me referring it to Earth observation and Blessing referred it to remote sensing. Um, and the two terms are used interchangeably in the community, um, but they don't mean the same thing. So remote sensing is literally just gathering information about an object without touching it. So our eyes are remote sensors, the camera is a remote sensor, um, but Earth observation is using remote sensing technologies to gather information about the surface of the planet. So all Earth observation is remote sensing, but not all remote sensing is Earth observation. So airport scanners and X-ray machines are also remote sensing technologies, but they're not Earth observation. So that's a, a simple example of how to differentiate between the terms. But you will hear both over the next three days being used interchangeably, like you would in most of the community. Um, so, where do we work within the Earth observation community? The electromagnetic spectrum. Um, I thought I would put a, a fun diagram of the spectrum up because it is high level physics, uh, high school um, level physics we're talking about here. Um, but everything in a remote sensing way works within the spectrum. So you've got your TV, your communications, your radio. Um, but the Earth observation community works within this small red box. So you'll notice that the visible light there is very, very, very narrow. And that's the only part of the spectrum that our eyes operate in. So this is all we can see. But with the sensors in space um, and on planes and on drones can see beyond that, that part that we can see. And it's this information here that we're going to explore a little bit in detail um, over the next three days. Um, so there are two types of sensing. Um, one is called active, um, and an active sensor sends a pulse out, whether that's microwave or a, a, a pulse of light, and records what comes back. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about active sensing um, this week, mostly because it's uh, a lot more complicated to understand than the passive type of sensing, which records the reflectance um, of the, the sun's radiance on the surface. Um, so it's how our camera, cameras work and it's how our eyes work. So it's a, it's a lot easier for us to understand because the images we get from passive remote sensing are similar to pictures from cameras. <clears throat> um, and the four things that you need to be aware of with all Earth observation, regardless of the type of sensing, are the four resolutions. So the first one is spatial. Um, and this is the ability of the sensor to identify objects on the ground. Um, and it's defined by pixels. I will explain on the next slide what pixels are. But you'll have pixel sizes that are large and pixel sizes that are small. Um, and that determines what you can detect on the ground. You have spectral resolution. So going back to the electromagnetic spectrum, this is all about how many um, components of the spectrum that the sensor measures. So does it just measure um, light in the visible part, or does it measure light beyond the visible? So that's what we call spectral resolution. 
Um, radio metric, so this is the, the, the measuring the signal strength. So if anybody remembers 8-bit video games and their very pixelated screens, well, that's kind of what we mean here and the ability of the imagery to give you more information within a pixel. Um, and then the last one is temporal. So that is how frequent a satellite sensor is going over a certain place uh, on Earth at any point in time. So let's go into a detail about these four resolutions. So for spatial, the first thing you need to know is what is a pixel? Now, the most important thing to know is that it's an arbitrary measurement and it doesn't actually relate to anything on the ground in any way whatsoever. And that's important to remember um, because Bran will go into types of classification tomorrow or the next day. And there's two different types of classification and one of them is per pixel. And it's the one we don't recommend, <laughs> basically, just because it doesn't relate to any specific feature on the ground. Um, and all it is is the, the instantaneous field of view of the sensor looking directly down on the Earth. So the narrower the instantaneous field of view, then the smaller your pixel size. And if you've got wide instantaneous field of view, then your pixel size are quite large. And what's important to remember here is that one pixel gives you one mean value in that part of the spectrum. So you only get one measurement in one pixel. Um, so if you need to measure really small objects, you need really small um, spatial features, but then you've got one pixel, one value still. So a little bit of a limitation, if you like, but also you will see later on today the differences between large and small pixels and what you can and cannot do with, with each of those pixel sizes. So this is an example visually of how that would look. Um, so this image here is a Landsat image and it's got 30 meter pixel squared. So one pixel is 30 meter squared on the ground. Um, it's worth pointing out that Landsat data at the moment is available open source. So you can download or access all Landsat imagery in Google Earth Engine. Um, and if you wanted to pick out changes in terms of this is vegetated, that is not, then that's pretty much all you can do with Landsat data at this scale. Um, the middle image is a Sentinel-2 image um, and it's got 10 meter pixel size. So you can, you can already see that it's still granular, but there's a lot more detail. So if you wanted to, to know the extent of the change from vegetation to bare ground, then you can do this with Sentinel, but perhaps not with, with Landsat. And again, Sentinel data is open source, so you have access to this at any point in time. You don't have to pay for it. The one at the end, this is actually a Pleiad image um, and it's a commercial satellite constellation and it costs a lot of money to access this data. Um, you're talking about thousands of pounds for a relatively small area, so it's not cheap. Um, but you do get much more detail. So if you wanted to pick out all of these individual scrub bushes here, then you would need this sort of resolution. So hopefully that gives you a flavour of the type of different things that you can do with different spatial resolution. We will explore this again in the field after lunch. Um, so like I said, it depends on your application. If you wanted to know the detail, then you're going to have to fork out for some commercial imagery or somebody to fly a drone for you. But if you're just wanting to measure things at a broad scale, then the three sources of satellite data may be a more appropriate view, even if it's just to do a recon, you know, to do the first steps of an analysis, and then you only highlight the areas that you need more detail, detail, um, detail on after doing the analysis with a broad scale. So moving on to the second resolution, which was spectral. Um, so the common terms in the Earth observation community is multispectral and hyperspectral. And what we mean here is a, a, an analysis of the bands. Um, so all Earth observation imagery comes in bands and we stack the bands together to make a true colour image. So a single band comes as grayscale. Um, you will also um, explore this more this afternoon. Um, but to get a, a red, green, blue image, a true colour image, so an image similar to what we do with the cameras, you have to have three of these. Um, one in the red band, one in the green band and one in the blue band. But m most multispectral sensors go beyond the visible. So they also have a band in the near infrared uh, and perhaps even, even further in the shortwave infrared parts. Um, so that's generally what most optical sensors um, capture imagery in multispectral. 
There is only one hyperspectral, fully hyperspectral sensor in space at the moment. It's old, it's not fully functioning. But the Copernicus program, or the European Space Agency, will be launching a new one um, over the next 10 years. But what this means is you've got really narrow bands in part of your spectrum. And to visualise that, I'm going to show you this. So multispectral are quite broad bands across the spectrum. So for the blue band, you've got lots of nanometers as part of the spectrum. So it's quite broad. Um, I've, I've shown you MODIS here just because it's got four bands across the blue spectrum. So it's more hyperspectral than multispectral. So multispectral, we'd expect three bands across the visible, a near infrared band, perhaps two, and then a couple of short infrared bands. Um, I will point out here too that we can um, actually sense thermal um, uh, from space, so the Landsat, the Landsat sensors have had thermal bands, as do MODIS and Aster. So we can measure temperature, so surface temperature and um, sea surface temperature in particular. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail about the thermal remote sensing, um, just because it's not very well established. There's not a lot of sensors out there that collect that kind of information. But if you're looking at water stress in plants or disease or something like that, then actually collecting temperature information would be very, very valuable because it might be able to pick out those pressures before you can see them in the, in the visible near infrared part of the spectrum. Um, so to give you an example of the science, how we use light science to um, well, create products from remote sensing data, I thought I'd give you an example of remote sensing of vegetation. So this is um, a cut, cut out of a leaf structure. Now we know that the blue and the red parts of the spectrum are absorbed by the leaf for, photosynth for photosynthesis and that the green part of the spectrum is mostly reflected and that's why we see plants as green. So that is something we know, the science tells us that. Um, the near infrared part of the spectrum actually ignores the chloroplast. It doesn't do much of anything for plants for photosynthesis and it interacts with the internal cell structure. So if, if there's any sort of disease or it's healthy, then the near infrared gives us a lot more information because nearly all of that information is reflected. So um, if I just move on to the, what we call spectral signatures. So this is the visible part. And you can see there's not a lot of reflectance. But in the near infrared, that jumps up straight away. So if you look at the strength of signal, we have a lot more information to play around with in the near infrared. Um, so, but it also gives you a chance to differentiate between different types of plants, different types of leaves, different types of species, perhaps. So near infrared really is the, the place to be if you're doing remote sensing with vegetation. Um, but if you're not, if that's not your, uh, not your application focus, then I'm showing you spectral signatures of other types of land covers. So soil is the red one here. So you will see none of the characteristics of vegetation because it doesn't photosynthesize. Um, and it just gives you a smooth curve along the spectrum like this. But it does have the water absorption features in the shortwave infrared. So maybe a sensor with shortwave infrared information, if you're doing soil-based analysis, would be very useful for you. Looking at you here, Steffi. <laughs> And then water, um, so this is something that we will explore this afternoon. Water reflects in the visible, but beyond the visible, it absorbs everything and it attenuates the light. So you should have, if you have a clear column of water, no reflectance whatsoever in the near infrared beyond in water, which makes it challenging to do remote sensing from space underneath the water. But you can do some stuff. So I've already mentioned that the visible part of the, of the spectrum does reflect some light from underneath the water surface. Um, the blue part of the spectrum in particular does give you the most information. Um, unfortunately, you need specific sort of conditions for this to work. So if you've got a rough surface and, and um, waves in particular, then the, white, the light doesn't even penetrate, so you're not going to get anything back. Um, if you've got a lot of sedimentation in the water column, then that's not going to give you anything back either. So it's a lot of caveats for remote sensing beneath the water surface, but it is possible. 
Um, places in the Caribbean, for example, works really well, as you can imagine. Um, in the Falklands and perhaps South Georgia, in particular, with the with the with the glaciers spewing stuff into the ocean, might not be so so good. But you can do some stuff. I know you can definitely map kelp, for example, around the Falklands using remote sensing technology, just because there's so much much of it and um, it's a, it's a clear signal. Um, you may not be able to pick out other types of habitats underneath the sea in the Falklands, but I think that is still worth exploring. I don't know the answer to that because nobody has done that research, as far as I'm aware. So the third resolution uh, was radiometric. This is only the, only one slide on this because uh, this is probably the least um, the the spec the, the resolution that you need to know about least, but it's fun to visualise. So two bit, you only get four values. So you've only got pixels that can give you one, two, three, four, and it'll look something like this, which means you can barely make out features. Um, so two bit data is going to be very difficult to work with. Four bit data is a bit better because you get 16 values. You may be able to pick out some really obvious features, um, but if you're doing anything nuanced, then you've got no hope. Now, eight bit data, um, you can definitely see some features and some definition to those features because you've got up to 256 values in your pixel. Um, a lot of the earlier Earth observation sensors launched um, were six to eight bits. So the first Landsat missions, for example, were at this resolution. And one of the benefits is that the volume of data is quite small because it limits the amount of um, radiometric depth that you've got. So like I said, some of the earlier sensors um, are this radiometric resolution, but not the subtle details may not be represented. Now, we currently have 16-bit data in, in orbit, but it gives you values from 0 to 65,535. So you can imagine the, the amount of information you've got in that, in that depth. So if you're looking at differences in condition of certain habitats, for example, you've got a much better chance of picking out those, those you know, minute, really subtle differences with this sort of data than you do with this sort of data. So Sentinel-2 currently um, orbits at 16-bit data, but it is absolutely enormous in size. So that's the limitation. So you, that's the trade-off you have to do there. If you want that detail, both spatial, spectral, and radiometric, I might add, then you're going to have to make space, make space for uh, uh, the volume of data somewhere. Um, so just to give you a feel, these are commercial um, satellite data and they operate uh, around the 11 to 12 bit data. So they're a bit better than this, but not as much as this. So maybe they're a happy medium, but again, you have to pay for those. So the last but not least, temporal resolution. Now the, the one big limitation from passive remote sensors is cloud, um, because passive sensors cannot see through cloud. So I thought I'd give you an example, um, a marine example. So this is uh, MODIS data um, that's currently orbiting on the Aqua uh, satellite. Uh, and it collects um, data over the whole Earth every day. Um, but as you can see, a daily image is covered in cloud and you've only got bits of data everywhere. Now, because it's going over everywhere on the globe every day, you can do things like temporal merging. So an eight day, if you combine eight days worth of data, it gives you a little bit more coverage, but there's still bits of cloud. Um, but to get close to full coverage, you need a month's worth of data. But because it's going over every day, it gives you a much higher chance of getting full coverage. But because the changes that might be, might be happening over that 30 day period, because you're putting them all together, you might miss those changes. So if you're actually trying to pick out changes in that time window, this is not uh, a good idea. Um, but if you're wanting a, a year baseline, then you can put a year's worth of data together to get that one baseline um, of that, um, the whole ocean if, if you want. But your, um, your accuracy is going to be low. So that's a trade-off with temporal resolution. Um, so just to sh give you a little bit more detail of what that looks like over land. So this is the first ever MODIS image taken on the Terra satellite. Um, and as you can see, it's covered in clouds. So this was taken uh, March 2000. But if you put a year's worth of data together, then you get all of the globe covered cloud free. 
So that's the benefit of doing this. Now, it makes a great picture. Um, and, you know, you could probably put it in Google Earth and have a, have a look around at um, all sorts of places in the world. And a lot of new features uh, on our landscape have been discovered using this type of technology. But you're just looking at it. It's not the best way to do analysis with it. Um, but saying that, there are lots of applications that only use this data for visually. Um, absolutely loads. And I didn't, as a person that's used this data analytically in the past, I, I sort of underestimated how much application there is for just looking at data. Um, and last but not least for this first session, um, unfortunately, all remote sensing is a proxy. So we're not taking direct measurements of anything. So you have to validate your measurements to make sure that the relationship you think you're seeing is actually what you are seeing. So you always need some sort of in-situ data. So it's data that's collected on the ground to give you some level of confidence that whatever product, whatever image you're looking at, that it gives you a confidence level that that's exactly what you're interpreting, the information you're getting from that data. Um, and this is a big, a big limitation. Um, but the limitation of, of the ground data is that it's usually collected in point form across the, you, your landscape, but it doesn't give you the spatial coverage. So if you bring those two data sets together, then you get a good quality validated product that gives you full spatial coverage of whatever you're trying to measure. So you, you almost always need in situ data, which is why we're doing a ground truthing exercise tomorrow afternoon. Um, because there are some things you have to consider slightly differently as to the type of data you may be used to collecting on the ground. Um, so I'm going to take a break there for a minute and uh, that's the basics of EO done. So the next bit is the tour of the technology, but I just thought if there's anything that wasn't clear, uh, or anybody has any questions, now would be a good time to, to ask. Megan has a question on Steffi, okay. Yeah. So, like I said, this is the type of resolution you need to worry about least because your data comes in that bit depth regardless. But it's all about the amount of values you can put in your pixel. So, for example, if you've only got 256 pixels, then you've only got 256 um, bits, then you've only got 256 values. So, you may be able to say between a forest and a grassland, but if you wanted to tell if that grassland was a different type of grassland, then you'd have less values to, to make that separation. So the more values you've got, the more chance you've got of separating different types of land covers that are similar, for example. So it's about being able to pick out subtle differences in the imagery. And when you look at it, you can tell it's, it's like looking at a, you know, your camera. If you've got an eight megapixel camera and you're taking a picture with it and then a 16 megapixel camera, then visually you can tell the difference. It's exactly the same with technology. Yeah. yeah. And the particular sensors or satellites just come either as a four bit, eight bit, 16 bit. Yeah, there's, there's, no, there's no four bit. There's, so Landsat 7 is eight bit, um, but Landsat 9 is going to be launched next year and then they will finally decommission Landsat 7 because it's stripey and a nightmare to work with. Um, so once Landsat 7 is decommissioned, then uh, most of the Earth observation sensors will be at least 11 and above in terms of bit depth. So you need to worry less about this. But if you're trying to pick out differences in your t and you're wondering why they're not there, then that might be one of the reasons why. Steffi. Daily data, and then you get yeah. the overview and it looks all nice and perfect. Yeah. If you buy satellite imagery from a company, do they do that for you when you're test perfect, or do you have to do it yourself? Ah, well, good question. So, I've got uh, um, some information about this in the advantages and limitations later on, but basically, you can pay for somebody to do it, but, it, uh, but the free data, it's not done for you. The commercial satellite providers will do it for you if you pay them extra. Um, but one of the limitations of this data is you need an, a remote sensing expert to do the pre-processing of the data for you. So exactly that. Um, and we've tried to limit that by 
producing something called analysis ready data sets, and I'm, I will be talking about that later. Yeah, so the coast resolution stuff and the marine um, area in remote sensing do produce analysis ready data projects for you. Um, but because it's coarse data, the, the pixel sizes are one to four kilometers, they don't have the adjacency effect issue that the high resolution data does. So it's a lot easier to create those projects with a confidence level. But the, high re the limitation of high resolution is that it introduces artifacts because of the size of the pixel. So it's a lot more difficult to create those products. Oh. Oh. It depends which one you download. Yeah. Well, it gives you the tool to search, to search for things like cloud. Um, but if you download level 1C data, then it's not being corrected for the atmosphere, for example. They do process to surface reflectance, but it's not great. I wouldn't recommend. <laughs> Um, not from ESA, anyway. Um, I think, Bruin, you had a question? Yeah, so I'm um, just thinking about this process product that you get, whether it's commercial or free. Yeah. Um, I guess it's, if you want a really long time series, it's going through various iterations of early sensors, repair sensors. But like MODIS. Like I mean, MODIS. it's been reprocessed, I think, six times now the archive has been reprocessed. Right. Yeah. And that was actually yeah. Repress, reprocess the entire data set mm -hmm. so that it's all. For, for MODIS data, it's fine because the volumes of data aren't massive. So you, it's a, it'll take you days to reprocess the whole archive. If you're talking about reprocessing the whole Landsat archive, which is you know 60 years worth of data at 30 meter, well, 90 to 30 meter resolution, then that will probably take you weeks in processing time to do that. And then the costs associated with that. So you want to do it less and less, basically. You only want to do it two, three times max. When you say they will do it, the, the provider will do it. Well, so the Landsat mission is um, monitored by the US Geological Survey. And that's who controls um, um, the data and owns the data. Um, and they are currently processing the whole archive to a surface reflectance product. So at the moment, they've only got the US coverage done. Um, but by the end of the year, they will have global data sets that are analysis ready, available for everybody. Um, it's worth noting that it's taken them a long time to get to this stage because the Landsat mission was commercialized in the 90s. So if countries didn't sign up to getting the data, then that it doesn't exist. So Europe was covered because the European Space Agency paid for it, for example. But whether that covers the Falklands or South Georgia, probably not. Um, just because, well, one, you needed to know that you needed to sign up to it to get the data. And two, if you didn't, then you've got a 10-year gap in your, in your archive. The other, the other thing with the Falklands is, you said to not do it, you started recording what? 2015. 2015. Yeah. But... Sentinel-2, C and D are already being built. So you've got the long-term continuity in the future, which you've also got with Landsat, but both Sentinel-2 and Landsat are calibrated in the visible and near-infrared, so you can use them together interchangeably in a harmonized way, in theory. But again, it's added yeah, complication. It, it, yeah. it is going back as well. Yeah. OK. Yeah. So how often is the Falklands and South Georgia getting new images to work with? OK. Got time? Good question. Um, so the course data goes over every day. Um, the Sentinel-2 data, it go, because there's two satellites in constellation 180 degrees from each other, they go over the equator every five days, but they're much more frequently at higher latitudes. So you get an image over the Falklands and South Georgia every two to three days from Sentinel-2, but cloud permitting. Um, and Landsat has a 16-day visit, but they've got Landsat-7 and Landsat-8 currently at a similar sort of constellation as Sentinel-2, so the revisit time is about eight days. Again, cloud permitting. But, they, but they're not going over the same time, so you know, maybe a Landsat image is available at the time you need it, but not to Sentinel and vice versa. Yeah. So fairly frequently. Yes. 
Sentinel-2 has a swap width of 290 kilometers. So it's score. I think one, one swap width covers most of the Falklands path from a tiny bit, um, just that way. Um, <laughs> and then it goes over the other bit and it mix, misses out some of the islands on the west. Um, but it's a massive swap width. The, the swap width of Landsat is a bit um, shorter. Um, yeah, so, but, the, but the actual orbit is, is actually not as wide as the Sentinel-2 one, so, yeah. Sentinel-2 South Georgia, one For South Georgia, yeah. You're, you're uh, located in the right place. <laughs> For South Georgia, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You might cover it later on, so if you do, that's fine. In terms of validation, mm -hmm. I'm guessing there isn't it. But is there sort of hard pass rules about how you need to go out and validate or revalidate your... Yeah, so ideally you need to validate every image. But that's impossible. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so what we've been doing so far is creating projects, so a surface reflectance project, and then comparing the method, the process, to the Aeronet site, which actually measures surface reflectance on the ground. And if the method produces a consistent output based on comparing the outputs with the Aeronet, then we assume that every image that's gone through the same process after that will have the same confidence level. Yeah. And then would you need to revalidate, say, if you, you change your model? Or, yes. Or, you know, if you, you know, over it. Yeah. So it's a sensible temporal. But that's just surface reflectance. So if you're creating another product on top of that using the surface reflectance, like the maps, then it's a different validation process. So you have to do that for the new product. Yeah. Which is why you need the in-situ data for whatever you're doing. It's essential. Yeah. Oh, but also not all available, yeah. <laughs> no, it's continuous, yeah. But what it can do over time is limit the amount you need to collect and where you need to go. So what the satellite data can tell you is exactly where you need to go to collect your ground data, as opposed to doing a, a, a stratified sampling across all of South Georgia or all of the Falklands. So you, there may be some areas where you definitely know you need to validate areas. Like the coastal mapping, for example, we didn't need validation points on top of the mountains in South Georgia because it was outside of scope of that product. So that sort of thing. Well, you can tell it's ice, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. So one of the ways of using drone imagery is to create validation data sets for validating satellite imagery. Just because the detail you get with drones, because of the spatial resolution, is so high, it's like you're there. You can vi you know, visually see things, blades of grass, whatever, but you can't see that from the satellite data. So one of the ways of using drones is to create validate validation sets, yeah. 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 You said, I think you said um, the satellite image can tell you where to go to get extra, where you need to go to get extra information. How, how does it tell you that? By looking at it, you can oh. tell, yeah. Well, yeah. So, like you've been doing with Neil with the drones, I guess, you can look at the image and see certain things about the image because our brains can interpret the images in one way it's telling the computer to do it the same way is what's difficult so actually our interpretation of the imagery is is actually a valid output yeah, so it's, it's mm. not an no process. well you can automate it bits of it if you're clever about it yeah. but uh, i wouldn't recommend doing that unless you're more confident in what you're looking for but just looking at the imagery is just as powerful as doing analysis. But the quality really depends on how... There's biases all over the place, yeah. Yeah. But the bio, there's biases with the field data in the same way, um, to an extent. So you need to, you need to think about the, all of the biases with the data. And that's actually one of the benefits of the satellite data, is it's consistent measurement across all of the surface. And if you don't do any human analysis of the data, then it's not biased because it's collecting the same type of data over the same place in a continuous way. But the minute you start introducing any other data set that's been collected by a human, then you're introducing bias one way or another. It could be unconsciously done, like most of it is, um, but you, you can't not use expert opinion, you know. It's just as valuable. 
but it gives you the evidence across all of the of the surface as opposed to that one point in time, if you like.